going. Great. Welcome, everybody. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to welcome you all. This is our inaugural SMME development webinar, the first in a series we're going to be offering every month with a special focus on developing supply chain skills in the SMME sector as opposed to the large corporates and to start building these skills and know-how within that. We also will be offering various programs. There will be a specific SMME conference leg as we go into the SAPEX conference in August. But most importantly, I think, is to talk a little bit about who's going to be doing the talking today. And that's Ken. So Ken is one of our SAPEX legends. So those of you who don't know Ken, he's been around for 30 years of SAPEX conferences. He's got 50 years of supply chain experience and is a Apex master instructor. So he brings a wealth of experience into the room today. And today he's going to be taking you through a conversation on warehousing and the role of a team leader in the warehouse. And hopefully it'll just set the scene in terms of wetting the taste buds for future um, conferences and future webinars. So I'm going to hand over to Ken at this point and not steal all his thunder, but let him get started. Thank you, Ken. Mm. Shanti, thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, welcome to all the participants out there. So yeah, as Shanti says, we've got this uh, SMME program going and over the next few months, we're going to talk about different aspects of supply chain and um, some of the information that you really need to know if you want to um, improve your businesses. So today we we're going to talk about warehousing and um, particularly about the, the team leader within the warehouse. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about inventory. In inventory is, is probably the most important part of any business. In fact, inventory is your business. And it's very important that you know exactly what you've got and where it is, and you keep it moving through your supply chain. Because any inventory that stands sitting around is gathering dust and it gathers cost. And inventory only has value when it is moving through the supply chain. So I think that's a pretty important aspect of, of warehousing. Warehouses are there, we put stuff in the warehouse, but we don't necessarily want it to sit there for a long period of time. We need it to get it down the supply chain and ultimately finish products to our customers. So the supply chain starts, all supply chains start with the earth. Everything we have, the earth provides. We either take fish out of the sea, apples off the tree, we dig minerals out of the ground, and uh, we go through a number of different processes, manufacturing, distribution, and then out to the actual consumer at the end of the day. And of course, today the return cycle is becoming very important as well, because we can't continue to keep digging stuff out of the ground. There's a finite source. We need to start learning how we can use those things we don't need anymore and how we can um, re, uh, recycle them or remanufacture them or reuse them in some way. So inventory in the supply chain is key. And um, as we can see on the left-hand side of this slide, we, we have suppliers, uh, we have manufacturers or producers, and we have customers. But also uh, service industries also have a supply chain as well, if you think about it. Um, and we have not only external supply chains, but we have supply chains within our own internal businesses as well. So that's something else one needs to be thinking about. The internal supply chain, how does information and materials flow through your internal supply chain? Not only that, but we need to understand about the external supply chain as well. How do materials come down through our business and out to the consumer? And I always say we need a lot of friends in the supply chain. You may have the best product in the world, but unless you've got some good friends out there in the supply chain to help you get those raw materials in and to get those finished products to the consumer, uh, you, you, your product's worth nothing at the end of the day, is it? So having lots of good friends in the supply chain, working together, collaborating together is very important. So what is the importance of inventory? Well, as I said earlier on, inventory is basically your business. Uh, it's usually the largest asset that's sitting on your balance sheet. 
and we need our best educated, best trained, most empowered people to look after that asset. That warehouse is your bank vault. That's where you're keeping your money. And we need to treat, treat it like a bank vault as well. And um, I think if uh, you think about your own bank account, um, it is generally 100% accurate and real time. It always amazes me when I go to the ATM and I put my card in there and I want some cash. Before it, see, I hear the machine going, but before the money has actually come out, I've got a message on my cell phone to tell me someone's taken money out of my account. That is real time. That is how uh, your system should be working in your business as well. Remember, the warehouse is your bank vault. Let's treat it as such and it should operate like your bank. So we have different categories of inventory as well. Um, and we'll go through some of those. And we need to understand the demand for inventory as well. It just doesn't, we just don't get randomly get something in and hope somebody's gonna buy it. We need to make sure that we have the right inventory for what the next person down the supply chain is looking for. And then the different functions of inventory. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those as well. So inventory then, it's on the, uh, on the balance sheet. You'll find uh, inventory on your balance sheet. And as I said, it's probably the largest item on the balance sheet. And you'll also find it in the, um, in the, in the current assets as well. So very much in financial reporting, inventory is very, very important. We get lots of different types of warehouses as well, don't we? Uh, if you're in manufacturing, you will have a raw materials warehouse with uh, maybe raw materials, components, maybe a lot of packaging materials. Uh, we could keep work in process uh, in our factory in another warehouse as well, stuff that's not finished yet. Or we might make components or sub-assemblies and put them in a warehouse. So we've got semi-finished parts in a warehouse. And of course, we presumably have finished products in a warehouse as well. Supply, supplies will have warehouses. We could have co uh, climate controlled warehouses, particularly in the agricultural business, like with apples. We have um, uh, controlled atmosphere warehouses where we can keep apples fresh. So they don't all have to be picked. Uh, sorry, they don't all have to be packed as they get picked off the trees. Uh, we could have a lockup storage uh, within the warehouse for high value items that we want to keep a, a special control over and we may have a lockups uh, area within a warehouse to put those in. A flammable warehouse for keeping uh, paints and thinners and fuels, things that are flammable and that we want to keep in a special area. If you're in an engineering company, you may have a tool warehouse where you're keeping tools and jigs uh, and they are available uh, when anybody needs to build those products. We could have equipment warehouses where there is a maybe electric drills or grinders uh, that people might need to do their work and they will come and book those out and then bring them back when they finished with them. Bonded warehouses, particularly if we're importing things and there's, there's, there's uh, import duty to be paid, we, we might put it in a bonded warehouse and then only pay the duty when it comes out of the bonded warehouse. We get public warehouses that will house anything for, with, for anybody or we might have private warehouses within our own organizations as well. And then there are these huge distribution centers for uh, the, 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 the supermarkets uh, where you would deliver your products to the distribution center and then they will get distributed out to the various uh, shops and, and retail outlets. But most warehouse, oops, most warehouses have the same processes. Okay, they, they have receiving, they have putting away, storage, replenishment, order selection and picking, kitting, uh, checking, packing, staging, shipping. And of course, there's a clerical and, and an office administration as well. So no matter what the warehouse is, they often have very, very similar processes happening in them. The layout of your warehouse is pretty important as well. And quite often in the old days, I found that a company would just cordon off a portion of the, the plant and say, here's the warehouse and put absolutely no thought into the design of that warehouse. Um, we need to consider the products that we're gonna be carrying. If you're gonna be carrying small nuts and bolts and bearings and things like that, it's much different than if you're gonna be carrying pallets 
of particular product. We need to look at the throughput considerations. Uh, the cost of warehousing space is important as well. So we want to use the cubic volume of the warehouse, not just the square meterage. And then we need to understand uh, what the size of the warehouse might be in the short term, uh, because we may need to expand it. Do we have enough room to expand? Or we might want to put in a mezzanine floor, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So there's the short term and the long term requirements for your warehouse and, and the layout. How are we going to expand it if we need it? Um, we need to have areas where we're going to receive product. We're going to have need areas where we're going to be shipping products. And those need to be divorced from each other. We don't want receiving and shipping areas together. Otherwise, that uh, could cause confusion with people delivering things and, and, and picking them up and we could get some confusion there. So we'd like to keep the receiving and shipping separate. Uh, storage methods, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but how are we going to store the items? Are we going to have dedicated storage? Are we going to have random storage? Are we going to have zone storage? There's a number of different ways in which we can store items. And then the aisle spacing, for example, are we just going to have people walking between racks and picking small items out of bins? Or are we going to have a forklift truck running up and down there um, delivering pallets, for example, or a stacker truck? It's going to change the aisle space that we need uh, for those particular um, products. And then there might be an area we might need for added value type of things like pricing and labeling or repacking or kitting, um, if that's the sort of business that you might be in. And there's a lot more post, what we call postponement taking place in warehouses. And, and because of that, we need to allow some space for that. So calculating your space requirements is pretty important. And uh, we, need to, we need to be able to do that to make sure that in the medium term, we're going to have enough space uh, to manage the products that uh, we're going to be going through our warehouse. So different types of warehousing. Um, if you're raw material extraction, of course, it's probably just a pile of coal or iron ore. Uh, component manufacturers are going to be different to a distribution center. If you've got timber products, they're probably going to keep them out in the yard. Agricultural products, for example, you might need a silo to keep the grain in. And then pharmaceuticals could be something different. You might need to keep them at uh, some sort of controlled temperature. So a lot of different requirements for different types of products. Of course, one of the most important things about the supply chain is reducing inventory volumes and keeping that inventory moving. So having some uh, KPIs in the warehouse is pretty important. And inventory turns to me is probably one of the most important KPIs. How often do we turn our inventory over? If, it, if in, inventory comes into your business and it, it only goes out about six months later, we've got two turns per year and that's not very good. I think if you've got somewhere around about 12 turns per year, that's not too bad. That means we're turning our inventory over uh, once a month. But when you consider companies like a uh, car assembly plant, for example, the wheels that go on the car, they have something like 365 turns a year because the wheels come in in the morning, they get put on the motor car and the motor car drives off the production line on the same day. So having that inventory turns is pretty important and understanding it and making sure that turns is going up. If you're further down the supply chain, maybe in retail, you might not use the term inventory turns, but you could use the term days of supply. In other words, how much inventory have I got? And on the average daily usage, how many days have I got left before um, I'm gonna run out of stock? So that's another measure. So it's a similar type of measure, but uh, it's used more in the retail end of the supply chain. At the top end of the supply chain, we tend to use the inventory turns measure. Inventory accuracy is always very important. And it's one of those areas I, when I go into a warehouse, I ask them what their inventory accuracy is. And they say, well, it's not bad, it's okay, it could be better. I want a number. and. We'll talk about stock taking later on, but with cycle counting, you should be able to get your inventory accuracy well above 99%. It's not that difficult if you do it properly. 
but we'll talk a little bit about that down the road here. Obsolete stock, big problem I find in warehouses. A lot of people have got a lot of stuff that nobody wants, and it takes up valuable shelf space. Uh, shelf space you need for the stuff that does move in your organization. So you need to have a process of getting rid of that obsolete stock. And, and don't do what one company in Cape Town here did many years ago when I went to see them. I see they built a new building out the back. And when I asked the boss why he built that building, he says, no, I'm putting all the stuff that nobody wants in there. In other words, all his obsolete stock. I mean, surely it would have been cheaper just to get rid of it, not build a building to keep it in. We do some crazy things in business. Inbound, inbound inventory. Um, I think receiving is probably one of the areas where a lot of mistakes happen uh, and inventory accuracy suffers because we don't measure properly what comes in. We also need to understand the components of lead time because when a, a purchase order is placed, it has a lead time on it. And if the lead time is a week, it might arrive in a week, but it doesn't mean to say that it's on the shelf available for use. It may have to go through a quality control check or what we would call a dock to stock process. And that could be a couple of days. So we need to make sure that all the elements of lead time are put into the system so we have sufficient time to purchase the product and to go through that dock to stock lead time. So we need to have the correct paperwork in place. And we need to make sure that purchase orders have the right dates on. Now, one of the most important things about planning in the supply chain is making sure there is no past due orders in the system. So if you, and then quite often I've been in a measured company's uh, purchase order systems and half the purchase orders are past due. They should have come before today and they're still not here. A planning system cannot manage a past due date. It doesn't know what to do with that. It assumes the stuff's arrived and doesn't give you that tell you you have a problem. So it's very important on a daily basis to go through your purchase orders and make sure that if there is uh, an order there that is past due, find out when it's going to arrive, change the date on the system. But many, many companies mm. don't do that, unfortunately. We might need a lot of equipment in the warehouse as well, particularly for incoming goods, uh, barcode scanners, perhaps um, uh, forklift trucks for offloading uh, um, containers and lorries. But to my mind, one of the most important pieces of equipment that you have at receiving is a scale. Because I find a lot of companies buy product by weight, but they don't have any way of confirming that that is what, or whether, whether that, that if, if that's what arrived as far as the weight is concerned. The first time I came across this was when I was a salesman and uh, one of my customers here in Cape Town phoned me up and told me the bags of product I was selling him were underweight. But you know, when I got there, he says, you know what, this scale, which cost him a lot of money in those days, he says it's paid for itself. Uh, this week, because I've suddenly realized that this company, by the way, made electrical um, components and equipment. And they use a lot of brass and a lot of copper. And he was buying from the non-ferrous suppliers in Cape Town here, brass and copper, and by weight. And he was assuming that when he was delivered, it was the right weight. And he found that, the, that his suppliers had been ripping him off for a number of years. And I found many, many cases over the years where if people will deliver less than, than, than they're supposed to, and uh, if you don't complain, they'll continue doing it. So make sure you can measure what comes in. So having good scales in receiving to my, my mind is very, very important. So we need to incoming goods processes. Uh, we need to have the right people uh, in, uh, in receiving as well to make sure that they understand the products. Do they recognize the products correctly? Do they identify the products correctly? Can they count? That's one of those things I found that people can't count. And yet we put them in the store and we're telling, asking them to confirm what's arrived and they can't count. Amazing. What about unloading goods? Uh, I've seen many times where containers have arrived at companies and they don't really have the right equipment to offload that container. And they come up with all sorts of 
weird ways of trying to drag stuff out with ropes and all things, sorts of things, So, which can be pretty dangerous. So we need to make sure that when we receive products that we can do it, on, it, do it safely and that we don't have a cluttered receiving areas where things are confusing. We need to, again, to keep materials moving through that receiving area. And, and possibly even organize with your suppliers that they deliver on a, on a regular basis or on a scheduled basis, such that you don't get everybody coming at the same time. And then um, um, when we might be at the other end where we have to um, pick and stage products, make sure that we've got a good area for that. You can see this nice little picture at the bottom here where these goods are probably being staged for particular manufacturing orders and they've got their own little trolley and all the components that are required are on the tr trolley there. Cross stocking. Cross stocking uh, sort of come to be very popular I think uh, more recently because we do want to keep things moving rapidly through the supply chain and, and for fast moving consumer goods and probably for fresh products, fresh, fresh produce we don't want to put it away in a warehouse somewhere and then come and pick it up and find that it's uh, it's gone bad. So quite often cross docking is one way of handling this. So when it comes into the facility, we then cross dock it to the outbound side of the warehouse and immediately put it on trucks and distribute it out probably to the supermarkets and the shops and the retail outlets. So cross docking is becoming more popular it means that we need less storage space because we're not storing so many things, but we still need to go through the proper process of receiving those items and then issuing them to whoever's gonna be taking them. So there are a lot of advantages, but some disadvantages to cross docking, but it's becoming a very much popular process in many, um, in many fast moving consumer goods areas. We need to, measure we need to measure and we need to improve the way we do things so we need to be able to collect data and get real-time analytics as i said your warehouse should be like your bank account it should be 100 percent accurate and real time and if the banks can do it you know why can't we do it in the warehouse if you think about a bank what do they do they receive money they look after it they account for it and then when you want it they, they issue it back to you again. And uh, we do exactly the same things in the warehouse, don't we? We receive things, we look after them, we account for them, and then we issue them. But quite often it goes missing or there are mistakes happen. We also want to reduce uh, traveling time within the warehouse because every time we move something a meter, it costs us money. And uh, are we going to use fixed or dynamic location, locations in the warehouse? Uh, if we're dealing with an engineering workshop where we've got nuts and bolts and, and pipe fittings and things like that, we've probably got dedicated storage. But when you're dealing with um, uh, raw materials and pallets of finished product, I don't want to dedicate a, part, a portion of the warehouse to a particular product. I want to be able to put it anywhere, but also know where it is, of course. So we would use dynamic locations in that, in that case. And keeping the warehouse clean and organized, very important. Housekeeping in the warehouse, absolutely important. One can almost walk into a warehouse and look at the housekeeping and how tidy it is and actually put a number on the accuracy. If it's a real mess, when you walk into a warehouse, you can guarantee that the stock accuracy in there is probably not going to be better than about 50 or 60%. But if everything's neat and tidy and ship shape and nicely labeled, um, then you can be pretty sure that the people are proud of what they do in the warehouse and their accuracy is probably going to be pretty good. Putting inventory in the right place. As we say, we receive it and then we have to go and put it in the warehouse and, and indicating in the computer system where it's being kept is very important because we need to know in the warehouse exactly what we have and exactly where it is as well. We don't want to spend time looking for parts. Um, many, many years ago, engineering workshop I was working with, they, they had, a, I don't know, 10,000 items in this workshop, in this warehouse, sorry. And um, they, they didn't know where anything was. 
and an engineer would come to the warehouse for a spare part for a machine. Oh, mm, that's interesting. Uh, let me go and see if we can find one of those. And they would spend up to two, I'm not joking, up to two hours walking around the warehouse looking for something that looked like the sample that the engineer brought up. I mean, a complete waste of time. They didn't know where anything was. So it's very important to know exactly what you have and where it is. So putting away process is very important and then indicating on the computer system where it is. And then we need to have that accuracy. We need to choose suitable methods for doing this. We need to have good housekeeping. We can use technology to identify items with barcodes or RFID scanners. Um, lot numbering and uh, batch control can be very important in many businesses, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, because if there's a problem, we need to know where those batches went to. We need to be able to recall them. And then, of course, in many industries as well, expiry dates are uh, very important as well. So we want to make sure that we're issuing uh, the, the, the old stuff out before the new stuff. And then the storage strategies that I mentioned. Are we going to randomly um, put things away in the warehouse and tell the computer system where it is? Or are we going to have a fixed location for that item? There's also another storage strategy we call zone storage. So we may have different zones for different items. So you may have a zone in the warehouse where you're keeping small nuts and bolts. And you may have another zone where you're keeping gearboxes and electric motors. You may have another zone with special racking to hold uh, strips of metal, for example. So we would also have maybe random or fixed locations within those zones. So inventory storage. We spoke about um, mezzanine floors. If, if, you, if you do have small items uh, in small bins and they're gonna be picked by a person, then you can't really have more than about two meters high racking. Otherwise you can't see or get into those racks. Then you may have a lot more space in the warehouse above you. And so one could put in a mezzanine floor like on this diagram here and have another a set of racks above that. So you double up your storage space. Also making sure that the racks are safe and put these uh, rack bumpers on if you're using forklift trucks, of course. So if the forklift truck hits the bumper, it's not going to knock the racking down, which has happened in many cases. Um, and then of course, in some warehouses, we have this multi-tier racking where we can go up to very high levels these days where we can keep palleted products to very high levels. Um, movable storage equipment. There are drive-through racks, so I can I can block stack things in a rack. Or what I've seen before, we have sort of flow racking. So you put the new stuff in one side and it maybe holds about six or eight pallets of product. And uh, you put the, the new product in the one side and take the old product out the other side. So we're using first in, first out. Conveyors, we've seen quite often in uh, warehouses. Big problem with conveyors are that they tend to divide the warehouse. Getting over conveyors or under conveyors is, is kind of difficult. So they do tend to divide up the space in the warehouse, which can be a bit of a problem but very useful in many warehouses. Uh, we can see a lot of conveyors being installed. Industrial trucks. Well, there's a lot of materials handling equipment that we see in the warehouses and it's becoming more and more sophisticated, even to the point where it is totally automatic. We now have what they call dark or black warehouses where there's no lights on. And um, I went to one in Sydney a few years ago, 50,000 pallet spaces, and nobody worked there, except I did find one guy sweeping the floor. Otherwise, the whole thing is being driven by computer engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, and automatic guided vehicles, 50,000 uh, pallet spaces. And then when they picked the product, it came down to a marshalling area. They had all 20 pallets or whatever went into a truck. The truck would back up and they would load the truck in 10 seconds. They just pushed all those pallets into the back of the truck in 10 seconds. So great deal of technology coming into warehousing these days and a lot of different types of equipment. 
over on the right hand side here if you're in heavy engineering you might have these overhead cranes and slings and one needs to be pretty careful if those are the types of things that you've got in your warehouse and then what about our outbound inventory we've got we've received the inventory we've put it away we're looking after it um, then customers are going to order it from us and so we have the order placement customer will place the order we then have to process it onto the computer system we then need to prepare the order and then ultimately it needs to be shipped so we need some uh, good processes around that particular order cycle so what about order picking and here huge amount of technology is coming in as well um, we can have lots of different order picking types we can have sectional picking or zone picking so you know a particular picker is responsible for one particular particular area or we can have one uh, picker who picks the whole order uh, we have a lot of paperless picking systems particularly picked by lights um, voice activated picking um, these are paperless picking systems which mean you don't have to wander around with a piece of paper and you've got both hands available to do the job huge amount of technology coming in, in into this area here um, we also have picker to part and part to picker traditionally the picker has gone into the warehouse to the part and pick the part today we're seeing a lot more parts to the picker so the picker stands still and the parts either arrive on robots or maybe they're on um, carousels, either vertical or horizontal car carousels. They type in the number they want and the, the product gets presented to them and they can pick it. So lots of technology coming into the into picking here. And what about types of issues as well? And that again depends on the warehouse. Uh, if we're in an engineering warehouse, we would probably use a requisition, which is being signed by the chief engineer. Uh, so that somebody can come along and take some parts out of the engineering wor workshop to maybe do some repairs. Uh, if you are in a manufacturing environment, then probably we would have a pig list, which comes out of the manufacturing system, and we will go and pick the products for an order. Um, uh, or it could be a customer order that we're picking for, in which case we would then get a pig list again, Go and check that we have the right products for the customer confirm the products so that we can then create the delivery note and then once the customer has confirmed that they've had the product we can then issue a, uh, an invoice to that particular customer so again different types of issues with different types of warehouses um, when it comes to um yeah loading and offloading uh, and uh, trucking it's probably not so much uh, warehouse activities but if we are loading trucks then we need to make sure that we load them in such a way that, uh, that the product is not going to get damaged on the way to the uh, to the ultimate consumer and of course we must load the trucks so they're not like the one on the bottom left hand corner here and of course we don't want long things poking out the back of trucks either and we want to make sure that when we load the truck it's not going to shift the load's not going to shift and, and the products is going to get damaged and of course for transportation there's a lot of accessories that we can um, we can use uh, we've got roll tainers tarpaulins uh, lashings and ropes etc these edge protectors on boxes perhaps or filling material to fill up the space in the container so the products can't fall over and of course on trucks we often find these um, these uh, truck mounted forklifts so when the truck gets to its destination it can offload those pallets of tiles or bricks for example or we get a lot of trucks with these tail lifts on so we can uh, pull the stuff uh, pull the, the, the cartons or, or crates onto the tail lift and then drop the tail lift down to the road level so we can get it off so again a lot of different technology all depending on the type of products that you're dealing with so yeah loading uh, dock loading uh, some of the hazards 
make sure that the truck's not going to move away while you're loading it or in the case here where they put some heavy items at the end of the container and it's tipped up. And we just need to be very careful when it comes to the loading. And also, even when it's people, make sure the ergonomics is right and make sure people lift product properly and that everything, safety is number one, isn't it, in the warehouse. So the number of things we need to look out for, make sure that people are working in a safe environment and they're working safely. And they're wearing the right protective equipment as well. But what about inventory? Why, why do we have inventory? What are the functions of inventory? Why do we carry inventory? Well, quite often we carry it to decouple between um, entities in the supply chain or between manufacturing processes because they work at different speeds. So we often have decoupling inventory or we have cycle inventory. When we make uh, products in the factory, I always make a batch of 10,000. Uh, so that's cycle inventory. Um, if I go into a warehouse, you should be, and I see a pile of inventory, you should be, be able to tell me exactly why it's there. You know, this is cycle inventory. We have to make 10,000 in the warehouse. Or this is anticipation inventory. We are expecting this demand from our customers over the next few weeks. So we've put this inventory in the warehouse. Pipeline inventory can be quite, um, quite heavy. Um, I worked in a company that made uh, shampoo, well, made plastic bottles. And shampoo bottles was one of them. And, and when you first, for a new product, you might make up to half a million or maybe a million bottles because they have to fill the pipeline have to fill all the warehouses between um, yourself and the manufacturer of the shampoo and the, and the distribution centers and the retail outlets. A lot of products sitting in the pipeline there. Uh, and then every month, maybe you just get an order for 10, 20,000 products just to top up the pipeline stock. So there's a lot of stock actually sitting in the supply chain there. And again, we want to try and get it to move as quickly as possible. And then we've got safety stock because we're never sure exactly how much inventory we really need because we don't know what the customer is exactly going to take. We need to carry some sort of extra buffer or safety stock to uh, account for that. The last one here, hedging inventory, is when we hear that there's going to be a shortage or the price is going up and um, we want to go and buy some hedging inventory. And I guess most of you went out on Tuesday afternoon and bought some hedging inventory yourselves. And uh, you went to fill your motor cars up because you heard the price was going up on Wednesday morning. Uh, you may not have needed it, but you wanted to squeeze that last liter into your tank to get it at the lower price. So you were in fact buying hedging inventory. What about item classification and coding? Well, we need to classify items, raw materials, finished products, distribution inventory. But once we've classified it, we also need to code it. We need to give it a number um, and make sure that that is a unique number for that particular item. So we need to understand the difference between an item and an SKU. And an item is a specific item in your system. Now you may have finished product of the factory and you may have half a dozen distribution centers around the country. So in fact, what you've got is one item and you've got seven SKUs. Okay, it's only one single item, but you've got it in seven different places. So you've got seven stock keeping units and each one of those stock keeping units needs to be managed separately. So when you consider a supermarket, I don't know, what, 10,000 items, 20,000 items, and there's two, 200 uh, outlets around the country. That's a lot of SKUs that need to be managed. And when it comes to um, item numbers or SKU numbers, number of different ways of handling this. Uh, we can have uh, sequential numbering or hierarchical numbering or significant codes. Um, and this is all everybody wants to put their own spin on this. But personally, if I, well, the last system I set up, I used five digits, okay, and we used sequential numbering. So item number one, item number two, item number three, and it doesn't matter what they are. Um, 
in a system like that, you can put like 99,999 parts. But I see some horrific item coding systems and uh, really a lot of them are very significant. And if you've got two digits in there that is the color, what happens when you get to the 99th color and you want 100th color? You can't put 100th color in. And when you consider the computer can look at thousands and thousands of different colors, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot by having significant digit codes. But that's another story. Now, in some cases, your basic ERP system may not have the functionality that you're looking for when it comes to warehousing. And so what a lot of companies might do is they might go and look for a best of breed warehouse management system and integrate that into their enterprise resource planning system, their ERP system. And these WMS systems have a lot more functionality uh, which can improve your customer service and productivity, um, et cetera, et cetera, and give you much more uh, more accurate processes that you can you put into your warehouse. So that's something you might want to be looking at. So some of the core features um, in a warehouse management system could be receiving and putting away, improving that process, uh, RFID and barcoding systems, um, location and storage, particularly if you're using random storage, you want to know where it is. And then picking and packing and customer returns. Uh, this is an area where a lot of mistakes happen on customer returns. I see a lot of warehouses don't have um, very good processes in that area. And of course, we need to have some performance man management um, KPIs, et cetera, which you're probably going to get much better in your warehouse management system than you might in your, your uh, ERP system. Manufacturing, of course, um, very important having the raw materials warehouse and having the items in the raw materials warehouse, because if we don't have the right raw materials or components or packaging materials, we can't build the product. So knowing what we have, where it is in real time and replenishing it on a regular basis or at the right time is very important. So what's the role of materials management in a manufacturing system? Well, we need to understand what the consumer demand is. We need to then uh, use our materials requirements planning system or demand driven MLP systems to determine what components are required and then make sure that we are replenishing those items properly. Bills of materials are very important, aren't they, in manufacturing, and make sure they are accurate as well, because it's the bill of materials that tell us what we need in our product. And if we've got the wrong components or not the right components, and we've got the wrong quantities, then we're going to get the wrong raw materials coming into the factory. So bills of materials accuracy, incredibly important. And then different manufacturing environments. Uh, if we make to stock, you're going to find the majority of your inventory sitting in finished goods because we need that to be able to supply the customer when they send us the order. But in a make to order or maybe an engineer to order environment, the majority of our raw materials are going to be sitting in raw materials and component stock waiting for that customer order. We'll then assemble it and then immediately ship it. So you should have very little product sitting in the finished goods store. In an assembled order business, we've probably got a lot of components and sub-assemblies which are coming into the organization, like a car assembly plant, for example. We're putting them together and then shipping the product off to the customer. So with different manufacturing environments, we're gonna see the inventory sitting in different different areas, different places. And then of course, in manufacturing, we might be involved in pull systems. We might have impl implemented theory of constraints in our organization using drum buffer rope and work cells. Um, we may have other pull systems that we put in place. We may have very much a just in time mentality. So products are arriving on a daily basis from our suppliers being assembled and then going out of the door. We want to try and eliminate waste in, in a lot of these cases. We need to have very responsive suppliers. We need to be quite flexible. There needs to be a lot of discipline. Uh, in fact, in environments like this, we've almost got rid of the warehouse 
a lot of the product is coming directly in from suppliers to the production line and not necessarily going through the warehouse. We could be using Kanban uh, systems as well. And uh, with Kanban systems, we could have Kanban boards or physical Kanbans, which could be a crate. Okay, and uh, we don't send the supplier an order, we send the supplier a crate and he looks at the crate and it says, ah, oh, it's item number 100 and there's 50 in the crate. So he makes 50, puts them in the crate and sends it back to you. Within an organization, a manufacturing organization, we might use Kanban card systems and we have different systems there. We have one card, two card, three bin uh, Kanban systems. And there are some rules that we need to understand when it comes to Kanbans. Stock taking, my favorite subject. Um, why, we, why do we take stock? Well, we need to confirm what we have in the warehouse. And it all started many years ago when the financial people needed to create the balance sheet at the end of the year. They needed to do, know what the value of inventory was in the warehouse. So they asked us to go down and count it, and then they could multiply it by the value and come up with a figure. It then moved into doing that every month um, so that they could do the balance sheets and the income statements and the, the financial statements for the business. And really that was the reason for going and counting the stock. It was never really to improve accuracy and doing stock takes doesn't improve your accuracy, okay? So doing those periodic, monthly, quarterly, annually uh, counts does not improve the accuracy. We find some errors, but we don't usually go and find out why those errors had occurred. And next time we do a count, those errors have occurred again. So what we need to be doing really is proper cycle counting, perpetual counting, going in on a daily basis and counting a few items every day. Now, the whole objective of cycle counting is not to get your stock accurate. It's to find out why it goes wrong and then go and fix the processes. And as you fix the processes, your stock becomes more and more and more and more accurate. And it is possible to get well above 99% accuracy in your warehouse using cycle counting processes. It also means that you don't need to shut the warehouse down for a day or two while everybody in the dog goes in and counts the stock. And uh, so it's a lot cheaper to do cycle counting and a lot more accurate. So, but make sure you have a proper cycle counting process, okay? Um, make sure that you start with a, a control group. Don't go in there and start cycle counting everything from day one. You need to do a control group to find out where the major causes of errors are occurring and then fix those first and then go in and do a proper cycle counting program. Okay, so we use that control group to determine initially where the major problems are. And then we need to set up a count frequency. So typically what I would do is I'd set, I'd count my A items um, once, a, once a month, count the B items say once every three months and C items maybe once every six, six months. And if there's any obsolete or redundant stock, I might go and count that once a year at year end. And if you do start cycle counting and your accuracy is well up in the high 90s, please, please never ever go in and do a full stock take again. You will put errors back in the system. And if your process, your proceedings, so your policies say that you must do a stock, full stock take, change the policy because you're just going to destroy all that hard work that's being done throughout the year. So, lastly, Let's talk a little bit about team leader responsibilities that we need to have an organogram. I mean, I need to have job descriptions for people that work in the warehouse. I reckon the job description of somebody who works in a warehouse is, is basically one line to create and maintain a 100% accurate real time store or warehouse. That's it. That's what they're there for to make sure that they, we know exactly what we have and where it is in real time. Okay, like your bank account. We need um, the role of the team leader must understand the business objectives and the difference between a goal and an objective. Okay, 
the objective is to have accurate inventory in the warehouse. The goal is to maybe have it 99%, above 99% accurate. Some of the key concepts of authority, um, being responsible and accountable, and there's a difference between being responsible and accountable, isn't there? And then uh, lastly over here, we've got uh, organizing tasks, formulating those goals and objectives, delegating to the people in the warehouse, and mostly utilizing the resources available to the team leader in the warehouse. And that's the people and the equipment, et cetera, using them optimally, okay? Getting the best out of those resources that we have. And then the concept of teams, okay? And putting teams together and having team leaders and the purpose of the team. We must understand what the purpose of the team is. And then the team needs to manage the processes. So all processes have inputs, they have outputs. We need feedback to make sure that things are happening correctly. And so all these business systems and business processes need to be managed properly. So we need a good set of uh, policies, procedures, and work instructions within the warehouse. And then when it comes to group dynamics, identifying and motivating teams, identifying group dynamics. And we get those four stages, don't we, of group dynamics. When you put a, a team together, it starts off with forming. Uh, we're starting to form the team. And then we get a bit of storming happening because when people find their feet in the team, who's gonna do what and when? And then we get some sort of norming uh, where things start working nicely and then we start performing. We start improving the way we do things. And of course, we always want to strengthen that team. So positive energy, communicate positively and openly, you know, create that team spirit. There's a lot of things we can do with team, teams, be, be approachable, make team members evaluations of positive experience, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of things we need to think about when it comes to teams. So brings me to the end of that presentation. I just want to check, we've got five minutes left. Um, if you go to the SAPEX website, all right, you'll notice that uh, on the home page we've got uh, this SMME project here. If you go into the SMME project, you're going to find a lot of information about the project. But under education, whoops, under education, Ooh, I've gone too far. Under education, you're going to find some details about courses that are available uh, to the members of the uh, SMME project. And if you want to uh, learn a little bit more about Warehouse Team Leader course there, if you go down on the website, you'll find uh, that you can download this particular skills program summary, which gives you an idea of the different modules that are available, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, do we have any questions from anybody? Shanti? I haven't seen any questions come up in the chat yet. Okay, does anybody, anybody want to? Put their hand up and ask or just come off mic? Very silent. I'll put them all to sleep, obviously. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> ah, no, Jenny's just saying, don't be shy. So guys, there's no question that is a silly question. If you're wondering something, it means there's someone else in the room who's too scared to ask. So be the brave one. Absolutely. I'd see there's seven things in the chat there. But um, yeah, look at that. That's us encouraging people to ask questions. <laughs> oh, is it? Nice okay. to see oh, you, Jan know. Tucker. <laughs> oh, Jan. Long time no see. Yes. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Great presentation, Ken. Uh, yeah. Just firing your skill set. Yeah. Santi, I see we have a hand up from Evelyn. Fantastic. Evelyn. Evelyn, if you'd like to unmute your microphone, please. There we go. 
Okay, hello everybody. Hi. I'm happy. I'm happy to join. It's for the first time I'm using this. I'm a small business. Now I did uh, write uh, the notes. Uh, I hear that I will uh, upload the notes that the uh, professor was talking about. I just want to know now when I did a, 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 a follow up, do everything now, it means now how are you going to, 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 to take me as a small business? I can uh, supply you guys. Or I will have a contract oh, yeah. with you. I'm not quite okay. sure what you're asking, Declan. I think I just want to know. Is... Go on. I, I, I just want to know after this, and then I will be able to supply you, or uh, it was just a a a a a a a a a class. Okay, are you sort of saying that you'd like to be part of the SMME project? Is that, yes. and how would you do that? Is that what you're saying? Yes, indeed. Okay, um, we will be getting uh, through to people. We're putting a SMME membership package together, um, which will be broadcast fairly shortly. It, it's, it's in the last throes of being organized. I think, is that right, Shanti? That's correct. So we just need to get the board mm. approval on the final package and then we'll be sharing it with everybody. But yeah. in the interim, we will be doing monthly conversations like this and talking through the various topics. So if you join each month, you will learn a little bit more. So the purpose of these conversations on the second Thursday of the month is to learn new things about the supply chain that you can take back to your business. Okay. Does that help, Evelyn? Yes, me. Thank you. Okay. okay I see Sibongili has got a hand up. Okay. Um, I was trying. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm trying to get the lady. She's thinking that uh, after the lesson today, we'll be absorbed to your database to be developed to be your suppliers. That's what she's asking. Then uh, the sense I'm getting is that we are being taught to go back and implement to what we are doing. Correct. Yeah. So we are yeah, what we're trying to do. Longer. What we're trying to do here is give you an indication of the sort of things that you need to be looking at in your business. Um, and depending on your business, of course, different things that you perhaps need to look at as far as the warehousing aspect is concerned. And we're going to be talking about other aspects of business over the next few months, uh, things like inventory replenishment and ops planning and scheduling and lean manufacturing perhaps, or supply chain and materials management. We're gonna be talking about some of these subjects um, such that you get an idea of the sort of things that you need to know. Um, and then you're gonna to need to perhaps go and have a look at these in a bit more depth and maybe attend a few classes or um, uh, go, go on some courses so you can learn in a little bit more depth so you can go and implement these within your organization. One last question is that, is that uh, yep. when, for an example, I'm based in Devon, I'm very close to the port. So mm -hmm. um, when you are looking for a place besides Transnet, um, what do you advise, for an example, when you are locating a place, if it mustn't be so far from the harbor or or, or you can have it in one township. Yeah, it depends very much on the business, of course, where you site your business. Um, some businesses like the car industry really formed around the coast because originally cars were built from knockdown kits, which came in by ships. But yeah. pharmaceutical companies tend to form around airports because raw materials and the finished products can be shipped out by air. So uh, do you, you might want to put your facilities close to where the raw materials are, or you might want to put the facilities closer to where the customers are. It depends very much on your business. And um, if you need to be close to the port because the product you're manufacturing is being shipped by, by, by shipping, then uh, yeah, by ship, then you're probably going to need to be near the port. 
So it's, it depends very much on the business that you're you're in as to where you cite your business. So all all right, I, I get to because for on my side, I work with farmers. I I, I process food. Like we make yams, crispy chips. You must order, guys. Okay. So yummy. Okay. <laughs> crispy <laughs> potato. Send us some samples. <laughs> yeah. So chips. Okay. Yes. Uh, where can I send the samples to? I would love to get samples too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it, for yeah. Us, it would be it would be nice maybe to have it around farmers. Uh, because it, when we grow big, for example, we're dreaming to export. So first, yeah. maybe the first warehouse we'll ever have is our main warehouse where we will dispatch things or such, sort of central distribution when yeah. we finish our goods waiting for dispatch. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, you're going to have to determine where the best place is going to be and whether you need uh, warehouses around the country. So you may have a manufacturing facility in Durban, but you might want to put up um, regional distribution centers in the major centers in South Africa. Or yeah. you could outsource that to a 3PL uh, rather than investing in those warehouses, uh, find a, a 3PL that can do the warehousing and uh, distribution for you. Might be one yeah. of the ways to go initially. There's another uh, right. chat. Um, where would a person be able to find information regarding shipping delays or relevant information to decide okay. on hedging stock? Yeah. You know, there are a number of uh, companies that uh, deal in this. It's pretty expensive, I understand. But if any risks are happening or things are happening around the world, like strikes in ports or hurricanes or floods or whatever it might be, uh, you can subscribe to these. And a lot of people have these um, risk control rooms where they're keeping, they're monitoring in a real time basis what's happening. Like when the ship got stuck in the uh, in the canal in the in the Suez Canal, um, there are people would have known about that immediately, so they can make a decision: should I reroute my ships or should I send my product in another way, rather than through the Suez Canal? Because this this could be could be a short, maybe a day or two to get it, but it was a lot longer than that, wasn't it? At the end of the day, so. Um, uh, yeah, there are companies out there that will alert you to these things that are happening, but I think it's kind of expensive. But some of the larger organizations, I think, um, uh, do subscribe to these uh, to these companies because it's important for them. Otherwise, you just have to keep your ear to the ground and keep your eye on the news and, and see what's happening globally. So I think everyone will join me in saying a huge thank you to Ken to dedicating his time this afternoon to sharing his experience and wisdom with us. Our Pleasure. next webinar is on the 12th of August at the same time, same place, and it'll be covering supply chain management. So it'll be a slightly different theme. So if anyone wants to register, please make sure you get onto www www.safex.org.za and make sure you register sooner rather than later. We're looking forward to hearing from you all again and seeing you all back here. Sorry, Shanti, to interrupt. I see Nazipo has um hand up. I don't know if Ken's happy to take one more question. I know we yeah, are. Sure. Over no, I'm happy. Hi, thank you very much. I you mentioned the, the Kanban system. Are there companies in yeah. South Africa that are currently doing it? Um, do you have any yeah. example? No, absolutely. It happens a lot in the car industry, in the car assembly plants. Um, and also there's a company down in Cape Town here that manufactures catalytic converters for, um, for the automobile industry. Most of it is um, shipped overseas. Uh, but on a daily basis, they're getting Kanbans in from their local suppliers, crates of product. And when I first met them or first did some work with them, they had a warehouse, in fact, but they ultimately got rid of that warehouse and got their suppliers to deliver on a regular basis right to the work cells that are making these catalytic converters. Even to the point where suppliers outside of Cape Town were delivering in bulk 
to a local warehouse and that warehouse was breaking that bulk down into the Kanban bins. And so that warehouse was actually, actually working like a local supplier. So everything was just coming in on a daily, well, twice a day, in fact. Every four hours, they would communicate what they needed. So they'd have a delivery in the morning directly to the work cells. They'd make, it takes about a minute to make a catalytic converter, by the way, in the work cell. They'd put it in a crate, put the crate in a, in a container. A container goes down to the harbor away. You want to see materials move in a business? Go to that business. <laughs> Nothing stands still. It really goes rapidly. But no, Kanbans are being used in a lot of areas where they're in, in that sort of business and, and certainly in the car industry as well. Okay, interesting. So I would assume that one would need to then position themselves closer to the customer. Uh, yeah, um, ideally, um, if if you are uh, supplying Kanbans to a, an assembly plant, yeah, you want to be quite close. In fact, if you can be in the same industrial area or even on the site, the industrial site uh, the, where the cars are being manufactured, it, it would help considerably, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm. Anything else? Any more? I don't see any more. No, that's no, okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm always available if you've got any questions. So you can always give me a call or send me a mail or go through SAPIX. They'll find me. Okay. Thank you, Ken. We appreciate it. Okay. Pleasure. All right, well, um, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. We're going to enjoy the rain in Cape Town here. It's still pouring down, I see. Eesh. Should dry up tomorrow with a bit of luck for the weekend. You can send a bit our come. way. We like rain. <laughs> yeah. Be well and warm, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Cheers. Thank Bye. Bye.